All right. Well, it's a pleasure to uh, be here with y'all um, to get to chat about um, natural language processing. Uh, self field of data science, which I am very, very excited about. Um, I'm very uh, passionate about it. Uh, I work on it in a day to day basis, and it's very, uh, you know, I find a good uh, amount of joy in being able to present it to you. And as soon as IK asked me, I was like, of course, let's do it. So <laughs> I'm really looking forward to it. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. I kind of do some, a little bit of intro stuff. I know I think some people are still kind of coming in. Um, but uh, yeah, we can go ahead and get started now and uh, go through some slides that I have pre prepared for y'all. About the intro to natural language processing, um, my goal for y'all to, to, today is to kind of show y'all, you know, kind of the basic techniques, but also kind of show you kind of where natural language processing almost in some sense kind of started and where we're at now and then where, we, um, where it's going to kind of go in the future, right? So, you know, we're going to talk about things like large language models towards the end, um, so, but some research that's happening. Um, I kind of show you from a viewpoint of how it's actually being used in industry today. Um, so that's something I'm really excited to show y'all um, today. So. We're talking about some of the basic stuff, but also we're talking about talking about some, some of the more advanced stuff um, later on during the presentation. So let me go ahead and I will uh, share my screen and then we can go ahead and get started. All right, so let me go ahead and do a view. And, and if there are any questions during the presentation, please feel free to interrupt me. I'm totally okay with that. As long as y'all are okay, I'm okay. <laughs> and just to make sure, can everyone see that? Are y'all good to go? Can y'all see the slides? Give us a thumbs up. I think we should be good to go there. Can y'all see that? Cool. All right, sounds great. Um, again, if you have any questions too, feel free to put them in the Q and A or put them in the webinar chat. Um, I have I have both those windows open, so you know if you want to, um, you know, ask me anything, we want to happy to kind of stop and uh, chat for the next uh, next hour. Okay, so really looking forward to it. Um, so for those of y'all who just came in, um, today we're going to be talking about natural language processing, kind of like a one on one course. But my goal is to kind of show you, you know, kind of the basic methodologies, but also show y'all where we're at now in the industry and then where we're planning to go in the future. Um, so that way you kind of get like a well-rounded, you know, kind of uh, viewpoint of NLP. Um, but uh, before that, you know, who is actually talking to you, <laughs> right? Who is the person that is actually going to be presenting to you for the next hour, okay? So I probably haven't mentioned it yet, but my name is Andrew Castillo. Um, I'm a data scientist um, at a healthcare technology company called Cover My Meds. Um, we are in the pharmacy kind of uh, portion of um, my Kind of a greater company called McKesson. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, Cover My Meds, um, a lot of what we deal with uh, on the pharmacy is going to be essentially around a prior authorization uh, process, right? So pretty much just trying to get um, you know approvals for medications um, that otherwise wouldn't have been approved by your uh, by your uh, insurance plan. Okay, and a lot of what I a lot of what we do on the data science team is essentially trying to predict whether PAs are, are, are going to be needed, whether PAs are going to be approved, um, what factors influence the PAs, um, so on and so forth, right? Um, and a lot of what I do in my day-to-day -day work is really kind of focus around the NLP side. So a lot of what I do is try to, I try to understand the uh, question sets on those prior authorizations um, and try and figure out, you know, which uh, factors influence the outcome of the PA. Um, can we look at a question and kind of understand um, reverse engineer why that PA got denied, you know, so on and so forth. And a lot of what I do has been, again, focused on the NLP stuff, um, building out statistical models to kind of model that behavior, um, uh, building out uh, anomaly detection tools for those kinds of things. So uh, for uh, a bunch of, it's a myriad of different things, but um, with a big focus being on NLP very recently, I would say. So uh, as I feel like I said that I love, I'm always, I'm always passionate about that. So I'm, always, I'm excited to talk to you about this cool stuff today. Um, if there's any questions that kind of like what I do in my day to day work, you know, we can always talk about it afterwards. I'm always happy to do a chat. All righty. Um, so, natural language processing, right? Let's kind of do like a basic 101 uh, kind of uh, understanding of what it is, right? Like, what is, what is it actually meant by that, right? I know people maybe are at different points in their career and they kind of want to understand what a basic viewpoint of it is. And then from there, we'll kind of build. Okay. So, what is natural language processing? Oftentimes you're going to hear me refer to it as NLP. Okay. So the, the crux of NLP, and I kind of put it right here in, in the slides, right? But the crux of NLP is to essentially train computers or machines, right? 
to understand the nuance of language. Okay, so that right there is essentially if somebody comes to you up on the street and they ask you, hey man, what's NLP? That's, that's, that's like a one liner, okay? It's essentially to try and teach machines to understand the nuance of language. Things that are so intuitive to us, right? Um, as humans, right? Like when I'm speaking to y'all, right? I know kind of what that next word is gonna be in my brain, right? Or maybe like the grammatical um, kind of nuances of English, you know, we're familiar with like when we're reading it or when we're writing it, right? But think about it now, right? Like if you're trying to learn a new language, you know, for example, if I'm trying to understand things like Norwegian or German, you know, languages I don't speak, right? That can get pretty tricky, right? Because you have to understand a new framework in which to be able to communicate information, right? This is kind of the same thing what we want to do with NLP, right? With NLP, we want to teach these machines, our models, right? How to understand language and be able to comprehend it, right? We want it to be able to understand the same exact patterns that we can as humans, right? Um, and essentially what we want to do is we want to use that enhanced comprehension that we've kind of trained them to do and, and, that, and that they can now um, you know, understand to accomplish human-related tasks, right? Um, that involve kind of a human intervention, right? It's kind of the big thing with NLP is that usually, you know, there's some kind of framework or objective that humans need to kind of try and do. <laughs> That's really hard for machines to do. And NLP, NLP kind of develops tools and resources to be able to do that, right? This is kind of a big thing with like GPT models, right? And people are able to say, hey, can you code this up for me? Or, you know, why does this happen? You know, can you complete this story? You know, so on and so forth, right? But they can only do that because they can understand language, right? And that's kind of the big thing I want us to think about today, right? Is that when you're trying to, um, well, you know, when, when you think about trying to teach, you know, uh, you know, these models language, try to think about it as yourself, right? Like how, you know, you know, there's a learning curve, right? You're trying to understand a new language. It's the same thing you have to do with these machines. And when you think about it, right? It kind of gets to my next bullet point here is that in order to understand, truly understand a language, you got to practice it, right? Um, you know, how do you practice it? You read, you write, you watch movies, you watch videos, right? You do a bunch of different things, right? Um, and it takes a lot of time to develop, right? And because of that, right, it's kind of the same thing with these models. Now, now granted, they can learn it much faster <laughs> because, you know, we kind of have, we can speed it up for them, right? But, um, you know, these models, it takes a good amount of time for us to learn that nuance, right? And the same way it does for a human, right? And it takes a lot of data to do that, right? It takes a lot of data to be able to teach that to them. The data can be in a structured format, a semi-structured, kind of like an XML format, unstructured, so on and so forth. But it takes a lot of data to teach these models um, kind of what that nuance of language is, what, what the patterns in that language is that it needs to under, actually understand, okay? And a lot of the techniques that they do um, with NLP just uses advanced mathematics and statistics, pretty much just understanding, you know, in some ways, like co-occurrences between words and phrases, um, to understand that nuance, okay? And there's different ways that we'll be talking about that today during the uh, presentation. But that kind of in a nutshell is what NLP is, y'all, right? It's just essentially the big thing is to try and teach machines or computers, you know, how to understand the, the nuance of English or German or French, Spanish, whatever it may be. Um, and to try and use that enhanced comprehension to do uh, various tasks that may involve a human um, in some capacity. Okay, so all I have to say, what can, what are those tasks, right? So there's various things. So you have things like machine translation, right? So how would you translate something to a different language? You know, you have something like on your phone, you might have like Google Translate, <laughs> for example, right? Um, you know, that's a big thing, right? Uh, what about like sentiment analysis, right? So as sentiment analysis is almost like trying to understand emotion in text, right? Like when I'm when I'm speaking to you, or excuse me, when, you, when you're reading something, right? If somebody puts it in all capital letters, that might, you know, if they say howdy, right, in all capital letters, that might mean something in a lowercase howdy, right? Or they put a bunch of exclamation points, right? We intuitively as humans can understand, oh, wait a minute, like they're saying that they're being really happy, they're being very cheerful, right? It's kind of the same thing with, um, with machines, right? We gotta teach them, okay, how can, you, how can we interpret that emotion, right? Um, or how can you understand like suspicion or sarcasm, you know, from text? Those kind of minor things that we almost like take for granted as, as humans, we want to try and teach it to humans or to, to the models so that way they can understand that, right? And the seminar analysis allows us to understand whether maybe it's, maybe you're working for Amazon and you want to try and say, okay, this review is a positive review or a negative review or neutral, or maybe it's really, really positive. Maybe it's really, really negative, right? So on and so forth. 
Um, so that's gonna be like sentiment analysis. Uh, text summarization, right? The big thing here, you know, you, you kind of see with these GPT models, we're trying to just take big, long corpuses of text and try to pretty much give you the TLDR on them. <laughs> um, the, uh, a lot of my, I have, I have a few colleagues who do this, but they work in more of the legal side um, of things, right? Something like lawyers and stuff. You know, these documents that lawyers have to read are just long. They're super long. I mean, they're hundreds of pages. And so they can build out models to try and take that information and pretty much just kind of, like I said, you know, a TLDR one page summary on it. That's a, this is a huge thing too for text summarization that's actually used in industry. Um, question answering, right? And like chatbots, right? Chatbots are a pretty big thing as well. Um, again, you think like, you know, when you are going to a bank or something, right? Or like an online banking tool, you're probably, you're probably talking to a chatbot to get you started. <laughs> just kind of how it is uh, nowadays. Um, speech to text, right? I think like, like Siri, right? If I talk to you, being able to take what I say or what you say and convert it to a text, right? All these different kinds of tools. And this is not, this is not exclusive, right? There are tons of tools. Um, there's only a few of them that actually do involve um, kind of NLP related tools that we'll be talking about today. All right. So kind of I'll give you a little bit of a precursor to what to expect. But um, before we move on, are there any questions at all? Questions, comments? Awesome. Sounds great. Sounds great. All righty. Cool, cool, cool. Okay. So let's go ahead and move on. So what are some uh, methodologies that we can use, right? So where's the methodologies? So, um, so there's various things to kind of consider with um, NLP, right? So the big thing that you want to think about, right, is when you have um, text, right? Text itself, um, you know, we can understand text, but how do you teach a machine who can really only understand <laughs> like numerical values, right? Or bytes, right? Um, this text, right? So we, you know, our the text itself is, a, is an unstructured value, right? It's, you know, if you can read it in, it's just going to be a plain text, right? So how do you actually convert that to a numerical um, kind of component, right? Because these, any kind of, I don't care if you feed it in a neural net, a boosted tree, whatever you want, it needs to actually look at structure, at structured data in some capacity, right? So the question to ask yourself with NLP, and one of the first things you learn um, in these basic classes, it's going to be to try and understand how do you convert that raw text to a structured representation, right? And this is where the idea of um, kind of this typical kind of workflow of NLP comes into play, okay? So uh, I'm going to kind of give you an example of how we do this, of how we turn this structured or unstructured version into kind of a structured kind of format, okay? And then kind of show you all some of the things that we can do with it, all right? So... The big thing, right, when you're looking at text data, and this is something I deal with on a day-to-day -day 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 basis, right? But whenever you have text, there's more than likely a human element involved in it. And because there's a human element involved in it, <laughs> right, um, that usually means that you're going to have, there's a, there's a lot of noise and there's a lot of mess, right? Especially when it comes to text, because people can write in different ways. There's, there's typos, um, you know, maybe you're doing a tweet versus doing a professional document, whatever it may be. Right. There's tons of different nuance that you have to kind of keep in mind. Right. So one of the first things you want to do when you're trying to get this structured, unstructured data into a structured format is you want to try and you need to clean it and you got to normalize it. Right. So I give one example here. Um, and I'll kind of talk to you some different ideas here. Right. But, you know, the text that you're looking at here, it says, OMG, this is the best thing ever. Love it so much. You know, hashtag awesome. Hashtag amazing with some uh, with some emojis behind it. Right. Um, so when you're looking at this, right, and I want to say, okay, well, we've got to first got to clean this up before we do anything with it. <laughs> so, um, depending on what you want to do, right, the first thing you want to think about is say, okay, hmm, well, you know, I, I kind of put it here for you, but like, you know, is this best kind of long format? Is that really necessary? Or can we just use like best? Or is the misspelling of love, can we just actually write that as just L-O-B-E, right? Same with it. Do we need to have all that excess repeated characters, right? We need to first kind of trim that down. Right, and we would do all of this like in Python, right? Uh, maybe you want to remove some excess uh, punctuation. Uh, maybe like the OMG, you maybe you want to just standardize that a little bit to be more like, oh my, uh, you know, oh my gosh, right? That way you can kind of maybe you know, split that up a little bit, right? Um, so you want to clean that up, and you also want to normalize it, right? And maybe when you want, to, maybe when you normalize it, another common thing that you want to do is, you, you know, you see how some things are lowercase, some things are uppercase, right? 
So oftentimes when people do this, they actually just straight up just lowercase everything um, just to kind of get everything on the same scale. Um, and when you do that, you actually allow um, for you know, less uh, possible vocabulary appearing <laughs> in, in, your, uh, in your text, right? Um, so that's another, that's another thing that can happen, right? Or maybe you want to uh, take the emojis and you want to either remove them or you want to replace them with a common emoji, in this case, like a heart or something. Right, that way it's kind of uniformly sentiment. Uh, depending on what you want to do, the hashtags may or may not be interesting, right? So you might want to just remove the hashtags and just leave it, then just leave amazing and awesome, right? Uh, maybe you're working for like uh, Twitter and you and you need this in there. That way you can understand, it, right? So kind of depends on the use case, right? But this kind of this is a situation where you have to clean and normalize text, right? And this happens a lot, and this pretty much is a lot of the work. <laughs> the work that happens initially is trying to clean it. And understand, okay, if you clean it, is there a way to essentially make it useful um, after the fact? Okay, so that's kind of the first thing that you want to do before you try and take your unstructured data into a structured format, right? It's pretty much just kind of clean it, standardizing it, and normalizing it. But after you do that, what's going to happen next, right? So after this process, is what's going to happen with tokenization, right? Now, when you think about tokenizing, right, there's different ways to tokenize it, especially nowadays, right? Um, you know, there are people who have trained tokenizers to do very unique, different things, which we'll talk about later on. Um, but what we're talking about for now is just kind of the, a basic kind of tokenization process, okay? So for example, like if you have a text that says, you know, I love eating pizza, but I hate pineapple on it, don't judge me, right? Um, you know, so you wanna look at this, there's different ways to tokenize it, right? Let's say, first off, you wanted to actually just tokenize sentences, right? So maybe you really don't care about breaking up uh, words, but you care about breaking up sentences, right? That's what it means to tokenize, right? I'm taking my text and I'm breaking it up into chunks, okay? So if I wanna break it up into chunks of sentences, you know, I can do it like this, right? Where I have, you know, my text and I wanna pretty much break it up on the, on the punctuation. So I'm gonna go ahead and have my first token will be this guy and the second token will be this guy, right? Or maybe you wanna take this entire text um, you want to then do a sentence token, tokenizer. And then after each sentence, you then just want to straight up just tokenize each sentence like this so that each sentence now is going to have its own unique um, words being split up. Okay. So you have, you know, this guy, what you do is you take each word and you pretty much put it up, put it into its own format within, within a list and you even keep the punctuation there. Okay. Um, but in this case, maybe you don't even need to say and tokenize it. Maybe you just want to straight up tokenize the entire text when you get done. That's also okay. Um, the big thing uh, with this, right, is that, you know, there's, there's different tokenizers for different things. So, um, you know, there's tokenizers that do this. Maybe you have a bunch of emojis inside of your uh, text, and you need to actually tokenize that as well, right? Uh, there's things like in Python, like with the tweet tokenizers, right, that will keep the emoji in one form or keep the hashtag inside of your, uh, your, no, your hashtag awesome, right? Um, different tokenizers do different things. This is kind of like a basic uniform tokenizer just to kind of get us started. Um, but I want to kind of keep that in mind, right? Like there's different ways to take your sentences and then chop it up into different pieces, okay? Um, there's tokenizers that pretty much take your text and they break it up into characters, right? So um, instead of, you know, words, you almost have like chunks of characters that you want to tokenize which is also an option to avoid this out of vocabulary problem that we used to call it, okay? So at this point, right, we have our unstructured data, we have it clean, we got to normalize, and now we have it tokenized, right? So now what, what can we do with it after that, right? You know, we have, we have this tokenized, we have these, this big long text and we've broken it up into chunks, so what can we do with it, okay? Um, so in this case, what we want to start thinking about, right, is how can we actually start getting this, these tokenized words, right, into some formats that are useful, right? So there's three different formats I'm going to talk to y'all um, beforehand, and then afterwards we'll kind of get into some uh, more complicated things. But real quick, we want to kind of start talking about what's called the bag of words method. Then we're going to talk about what's called uh, TFIDF or term frequency inverse document frequency, and then we'll have word embeddings, okay, which are kind of the precursor to uh, some of the more complicated things we'll talk about later on. But let's start, about, let's start off with bag of words, right? So what's bag of words? And again, if there's any questions, y'all feel free to put them in the Q&A and we weren't happy to uh, answer them, okay? Um, 
So what's the bag of words method here, right? So the bag of words, right? Essentially, imagine you have a bunch of reviews. Let's say, you know, you're working for, you know, it's like in this case, you know, some restaurant service or something, and you have a bunch of reviews and you want to try and understand something about those reviews, right? So assumed you, you know, you normalize everything, you cleaned everything up, you were able to kind of um, do all the pre stuff we just talked about. What you want to do, right? Is you, you're, the first of the bag of words is you want to create a vocabulary for your corpus of documents, right? You know, you might have a bunch of reviews, you know, maybe you might have tens of thousands of reviews and you want to create a vocabulary that those rules are based off of, right? So you pretty much take all your reviews, you tokenize all the words, right? all the other reviews, you have a bunch of words, right? And what you're going to do with, what you're going to do with that, with all that vocabulary is you're going to say, okay, I know which words can appear in my corpus of documents. So what I want to do is pretty much say, okay, for each review that I have, right, can I create a matrix, right, that kind of maps the reviews to the words? So the way you do that is that each record in your matrix is going to be a review, and then you're going to have a feature. All the features in your matrix are going to correspond to one of the words that were inside of your vocabulary, right? So I'm going to have one feature for the, one feature for food one feature for was, delicious, so on and so forth, right? So I have reviews as the records, the vocabulary as the features, right? And then the entries inside the matrix are gonna count the number of times that each of the words inside the reviews appeared, right? So for example, for review one, right? For review one, if you look at the word food, I'm gonna have review one, I'm gonna have a bunch of zeros, except in the, except in with food, right? And food, I'm going to have it as a one because food appeared once in that review, right? Then I'm going to go to like, let's say was, right? In that same record, I'm going to have that food being one. And then for the, for the was word, I'm going to have a two there, right? Because was appeared twice for that review, right? Um, delicious. I'm going to have in that record, I'm going to have delicious appearing once. Excellent. Appearing once. Uh, the is going to appear twice. Right. So I have a review and I'm pretty much going to say, OK, how many times do, do each of these words appear in, the, in, in that review? And I'm going to say, OK, it appears once, twice, three times, whatever it may be. And I'm going to put all those numbers inside of that um, record. And um, all the other words in my vocabulary, they're all going to be zeros because they didn't appear. Right. Um, so, for example, like in review one, the, the, the word restaurant does not appear. So where there's restaurant up in the feature, that's going to be a zero. Uh, noisy, that's going to be a zero. Portion, that's going to be a zero. So on and so forth, right? So in this way, right, bag of words is pretty much just counting the number of times words <laughs> from your vocabulary appear inside of your review, okay? That's all the bag of words is. It's pretty much kind of saying how many times, like a term frequency, right? How many times do certain words like the or food, was, delicious, so on and so forth, appear inside that review? And the idea behind that, right, is that if a word appears more often, it could either be more or less important, right, to do subsequent down the kind of down the line path, the uh, tasks, right? So we kind of have this bag of words framework, right, where we're counting up the number of times words appear. But what people realized is they say, okay, well, the bag of words is awesome because we're counting frequency of words, right? Like, again, I had the review and I, you know, the appears twice, was appears twice, delicious appears once, so on and so forth. Right. Um, but like the frequency of words, like doesn't really mean much. <laughs> right. If um, you can't really say something about it. Right. Because of the rarity of the events. Right. So, for example, you know, like if you have um, one document uh, about a dog that um, appears three times. Right. And you have another document uh, about a dog or excuse me, you have another document in which dog appears uh, 10 times. Right? Well, you might think the second document is more relevant to dogs, right? But what really are we not taking into account there, right? We're, we need to take into account the number or the length of the document that dog appeared in, right? So if in the first document, dog appeared three times, but it appeared in a 30 letter email or a 30 word email, right? Versus the second time where dog appeared 10 times, but it appeared in a novel. <laughs> Uh, a novel that was 300 pages or something, right? Dog might be more relevant in that first one, right? Because comparatively, this is 10% of the document 
relative to however many words we have over here, but it's really much smaller, right? So you need to take into account kind of a normalized term frequency, as we call it, right? So not just number of times dog appears, but how much, how many times does a dog appear relative to the um, document that it's in, right? That's kind of what this term frequency vector that you're looking at here is referring to, right? Um, you know, how many times does, um, you know, we, we saw that was appear twice, the appears twice, but what, how many times does it appear relative to how long that review is, right? If people are complaining about it being noisy, does noisy appear multiple times? If it does, it might be important, right? This is the idea of term frequency. We're trying to get like a percentage of the number of times that the word appears, right? But then you also have this idea of a inverse document frequency, right? So what is that? When you think about this, you think, okay, well, if I have 10 reviews, right? Um, and three of them uh, contain the word noisy, right? I then say, okay, well, I have 10 documents and three of them contain the word noisy, right? Or excuse me, if I have 10 documents and three of them contain the word noisy, right? That means three documents, right? Out of 10 contain that word noisy. That's called the document frequency, right? So three out of 10 contain the word noisy, right? Or three out of 10 contain the word restaurant or seven out of 10 uh, had the word plot. I don't know, something like that, right? The inverse document frequency is gonna be the, the reciprocal, right? Reciprocal is probably a better word. <laughs> but the idea behind that, right? That the inverse document frequency, right? Is essentially saying, okay, this TF IDF, it's a scaling factor, right? So if you have 10 documents and they all have the word the in there, well, what does that mean? That means we have 10 documents and 10 of them, right? Have the word the. Well, 10 divided by 10 is one and a log of one is gonna be zero, right? So for that word the, our TFIDF is gonna say, well, wait a minute. I mean, if it appeared in every document, it's probably not important. So we're gonna take that word the and we're gonna scale it down to zero. Right. Or comparatively, if it maybe did not appear enough times, maybe we might scale it up to be too big or too small. Right. So this TF IDF vector is kind of giving us a way of understanding, um, you know, kind of normalizing the how, how often kind of words appear. But also taking into account um, essentially like the the number of times our words appear across all the documents. So not just the number of times the word appears in the document, but also across all the documents inside our corpus. Okay. So that's kind of like the next step of how we would try and understand how to take this unstructured data into a structured format. Okay. But then what happens after that, right? This is kind of where the more advanced stuff comes into play, right? So people kind of realized, right? Like, you know, way back, back in like 2014, 2013, right? Like, okay, we have this, numerical okay we, we can count words you know we can you know we can see how many times they appear in the document then across all the documents that's cool but you know like it doesn't always tell you everything right because you want to try and understand statistical co-word occurrences um and sometimes you know words can appear very close to each other that are important but sometimes they can appear far apart from that are important right so this is really where more of the more advanced kind of topics came in with neural networks, right? And this idea of word to vec, right? Um, so a word to vec kind of came into play um, with uh, trying to understand, uh, you know, context words for certain words, right? So essentially, uh, I kind of give, a, give an example here, right? But you know, if you say here the movie was good, it tries to predict the context words surrounding that word good. Right. Or for example, another example I like to give, you know, if you're looking at an uh, example with dog, what words appear close to dog? <laughs> like maybe bark or run or sit, you know, things like that. And people try to develop a process to essentially not just be able to create a kind of word occurrence, but what's called a word embedding based off of those kind of statistical co-occurrences. Right. And that's this is where these idea of the neural networks kind of came into play. Um, and, with, uh, and we'll kind of get more to it here in a second, but you know, word to vec essentially is trying to learn a bunch of different uh, documents now, right? Um, and there's two different ways of thinking, of thinking about word to vec There's this kind of continuous bag of words method, or there's a script gram, skip gram method. They're very, they're very similar. 
With continuous bag of words, you have the context and you're trying to predict the target. Whereas with skip gram, you have the you almost have the target and you want to predict the context words, right? And you want to train your neural net to do that. And when you're when you train your neural net to do that, it can essentially try and capture it can capture relationships between words and be able to capture relationships between the frequency of those words as well, right? Which is very, very interesting. Um, and throughout all of this, right, we have, you know, we have this bag of words method. And again, and with the word to back, what happens is you do get these word embeddings, right? So you can say, okay, here is the word bark, and here is a vector representing bark, right? That is gonna be some length long. Um, here is another vector for sit. Here's an, uh, and the vector for sit. We have another vector for uh, cat, and the vector for cat, so on and so forth. And with that, um, if we go back to this first picture here, whoops. Um, we can we have these vectors for for um, various words, and we can see okay, well, how close together are those words to each other, right? Um, and you can kind of check that with like cosine similarity. But right? in theory, if those vectors are closer to each other, right, the more relevant they are to each other, right? So like man and grandfather will be closer together, or um, like child and infant, right? Because maybe those two should be. I mean, we know contextually that those two should be pretty similar. Or maybe boy and man, right? They should be farther apart. Or boy and girl should be farther apart, right? So these word embeddings, we essentially are now, instead of just thinking about these just word occurrence vectors, we have a deeper kind of nuanced understanding of them by representing them as vectors generated from these neural nets. And with those vectors, with those vector representation of words, we can try and understand um, different things, but more nuanced things, because there's more patterns to be discovered in that case. It's really not just number of times words appear in documents, okay? So as a quick summary, okay, we kind of have, we talked about different methods, right? We talked about bag of words, which is pretty much just kind of counting the number of times. Just it's simple, very simple, frequency-based interpretation. We have the TF idea, which is kind of like a scaling term, right, um, of the bag of words method. We have word to vec, which is pretty much going to be an embedding. So it's kind of taking a neural network, and we're kind of just taking these words, and we're going to give each each word a new kind of latent vector to try and understand what that word means relative to other words and how close they are to each other, okay? And then you also have this thing called, uh, the other method called GLOVE, as well as fast text. There's two different ways. There's two other methods here that are similar to word to vec. Um, but GLOVE, all we're doing there is pretty much just trying to uh, understand co-occurrences um, and trying to predict the number of times those co-occurrences occur, right? So instead of, the, with word to vec, what word to vec does, it pretty much tries to calculate the number of times, like. Uh, Right, it, it pretty much looks at every iteration of dog and bark occurring next to each other, right? With these with these skip grams, right? It tries to understand, like, okay, dog and bark occur here, dog and bark occur here, dog and bark occur here. So it it, it will do it however many number of times it happens, right? Glove tries to say, okay, well, instead of looking at that each time it happens, is there some way that we can calculate the number of times it will happen, right? So if it, if it happens n times, Glove tries to predict that number n, right, ahead of time. And that's kind of what it's what it's uh, what the model is trained on. That way, you don't it's, it's it's a little bit faster. That way, you don't have to worry about calculating this each time you go through it, and it's faster as well. So it's more efficient. Um, and fast text, I didn't put it in here, but fast text kind of takes that same problem, and instead of looking at like skip grams, it almost looks at like uh, it's a character level model, right? So we're we instead of looking at words, we're looking at like uh, maybe you know characters grouped together to try and understand uh, patterns. Okay. But all that to say, right, y'all, um, is that all these different methodologies, the main thing I want to try to get from this is the fact that they're, we're trying to pretty much take this structured data and represent it numerically, right? And try to give it a representation that can be used for later on down the, learn, down the line purposes, okay? And what people try to do with this is they try to do various different things, right? You know, they try to do this with machine translation, summarization, a really early preliminary chatbot, right? Think about things that are trying to predict that next word, right? Um, and, you know, uh, with the with language models, right? Language models have been around for a, forever, right? I know nowadays we see GPT, we see BERT, we see, you know, Llama and Falcon, you know, all these big beefy models, right? But before that, y'all, there was very basic rudimentary things, right? Like, um, like latent semantic analysis or latent Dirichlet allocation, right? Or doc to right? These different types of uh, uh, methodologies which are trying to embed information in there, right? Um, and all these different kinds of models they're trying to do is they're looking at co-occurrences, 
right? How many times does dog appear next to bark? And, you know, can we try and model the next word that's going to appear in a sentence based off of those co-occurrences, right? These language models have been around for a long time. Yeah, since like the 90s, right? They've been around for a long time, um, or early 2000s, right? And um, methodologies have been built on that, right? So one thing I haven't talked about, right, um, I'm gonna kind of mention briefly, but you know, we kind of have these basic kind of, I call them like fundamental models, like, you know, uh, like LDA and LSA, things like that. But then people kind of got to this, uh, this kind of uh, understood about like, okay, what about more like recurrent neural nets? Right or like uh, LSTMs and things like that, which well, I won't get into this for time purposes. But you know, we kind of took a step above that, right? To do the, to do these kinds of examples. But even then, people realized, okay, with these recurrent neural nets and LSTMs, there's a bottleneck issue, right? When I'm trying to translate a sentence, right? And it's the same thing with the, with the basic models too. What people what people understood way back when is that if I have a um, a sentence, right? For example, let's say I want to translate to Spanish. Howdy, how are you? My name is Andrew Castillo. I'm a data scientist, right? That's not too bad of a, of a phrase to um, translate, right? Um, but as the phrase gets longer and longer and longer and longer and longer that I want to translate, right? What happens, right? Well, what happens is all that information needs to get compressed into some hidden state before it can almost get decompressed, right? And it's kind of a similar thing here with the language model, right? There's too much information to kind of pack in before we unpack it to do a translation, for example, right? People realize this with these basic models using the kind of the, the word to the word to Beck and the uh, word to Beck and um, TFIDF and all that good stuff, right? They understood it with the RNNs and LSTM. Like we still are facing this bottleneck issue. So how can we get out of this bottleneck issue to do these kinds of tasks, right? Because these tasks of trying to do machine translation or doing a chatbot, right? Like there's a lot of information. Like if, if you go to if you go to chat GPT right now, you can feed it some paragraph and assuming it doesn't fall out of the context, which I think it's actually pretty darn good now, you can pretty much feed a paragraph of information. It can spit something out, right? That's a big revolution that's happened, right? Because before, you know, it, it's been hard to do that because um, of that, because there's, there's too much information to unpack in that. And this is really where um, the idea back in 2017, I would say, of the, of the large language model that we see it today is really revolutionized. And this is where the idea of kind of the entry of the world, like I call, as I call it, um, of LLMs, okay? Large language models are really, are, is where we're really gonna shine now. And to end the presentation, I kind of talk about this for a second, um, about, about LLMs and kind of what they're doing here um, to try and take that information and try to uncompress it. That way we can do these tasks um that we see okay um well from the one uh any questions at all what we're saying there cool all right well let's do some let's do some lm and then we can call it a day we've got 20 minutes left so if you're not familiar already, right, what is a large language model, right? So I kind of already, I kind of already alluded to it, right? These language models have been around forever, but these large language models are essentially, they're a type of, they're a more advanced model of that, right? They're an advanced probabilistic and statistical model, right? That are designed to understand human language, right? That's kind of the big thing with language models and NLP in general. We want to understand human language. Um, and it's going to use advanced techniques from deep learning, things like attention, for example, to try and understand and process that textual data, okay? To understand the patterns and structures of the data. That's all these models are doing off from the get-go. They're trying to understand patterns and data. In the same way your gradient boosted tree does, you wanna do that here, okay? And these LLMs are essentially trained to understand a bunch of different things, right? They're trained off of various resources like books and websites and articles, whatever it may be, to do things like semantic understanding, to do things like text generation, language translation, things like that, okay? Um, and their framework and their architecture is going to be what's actually really interesting. We'll talk about here uh, in the next few minutes. Okay. But there's different examples, right? Like there's things like ChatGPT, for example. I'm not sure we're all familiar with that. Uh, Facebook just kind of released their open source version, I would say, called Llama, or more like Llama 2.0 of ChatGPT. Uh, you know, the the uh, Technology Institute in Israel kind of released Falcon, right? So all these things have been coming out to try and uh, compete with ChatGPT because ChatGPT is kind of closed source, right? Um, but a bunch of different models have come out to do these various different things. Okay. 
Now, I kind of um, alluded to it earlier, but I want to make sure we're on the same page with this, okay? But all of these language models are, all, are built off of what's called essentially a neural net, right? So you're going to hear me say this a lot, but if you're not familiar with it, just kind of do it real quickly, okay? Kind of the elevator pitch for a neural net is um, it's essentially a mathematical abstraction of the brain, all right? It's a series of algorithms um, that, um, that are trying to essentially, they're using you know, advanced math techniques to understand intricate patterns, right? Um, and we're pretty much trying to make information flow through the neural net, flow through the model, right? And essentially allow the model to understand and learn from itself, right? Understand from its mistakes um, and, you know, make a better overall adjustment to what can be learned, okay? These neural nets kind of form the backbone of a lot of different things in industry, but in particular, these language models. So I want to at least make sure we're on the same page with it, okay? They're really good to do things. Like to understand basic things that involve human intervention, okay? But even things like the, like the, with these language models, like in word to vec do use basic, even just feed-forward architectures, okay? So just make sure we're on the same page there. But this is kind of the big thing, right? So how are LLMs built, right? This is, this is really where, you know, the, the rubber meets the road, right? This is where all the hard stuff comes into play, okay? So the LLMs, right, are based off of what's called the transformer architecture, okay, um, as well as a modification of what's essentially known as attention, right. So back in 2017, right, um, Vaswani uh, from Google Brain, right, and all, and all these other authors uh, pretty much came up or developed this transformer, what they call a transformer architecture, right. And the architecture is right here. And honestly, y'all, it's not that uh, crazy. It's actually very simple. Uh, when you have this, you have the encoder block here and you have the decoder block here, right? And what they said pretty much is, um, you know, they, they had this idea of attention. The idea of attention is, was well, well known before um, attention is all you need that came out with the transform architecture. Attention came out like in 2015 or 2014, if I remember correctly. Um, but what they claim in this paper, attention is all you need, where they developed this architecture, is they really just needed that attention mechanism, but just doing using it in a very nuanced way, okay? So you might be asking, what is attention, right? So attention itself, in a nutshell, is just trying to understand, okay, we're trying to teach the model, right? If I'm trying to translate a sentence, right, do I really need to pay attention to the entire phrase that I'm packing in here, right? Like, for example, um, Let's say I want to translate the dog went to the park and ran with the other dog, right? I want to translate that to German. When I'm trying to predict the next word in the translation, do I really need to understand the entire thing, the entire previous sentence, or do I only really need to understand bits and pieces of it, right? We as humans, like I may not necessarily need to understand the entire thing. I may need to understand one portion of it. And then for the next sentence, for the next word, I'm going to need the previous two portions. For the next word, I'm going to need a previous subset, so on and so forth, right? Attention, and more in particular, self-attention, um, which we won't go into the, minor, the nuances of that just to, for today for timing purposes, but it's, attention is pretty much trying to say, okay, in this sentence, um, which words do I actually need to wait more, or in other words, pay attention to, hence the name, <laughs> pay attention to in order to make that translation, right? And this attention is all you need paper. They built it based off of, uh, machine translation that was their goal right um and the, that's kind of the idea right is i have this whole phrase instead of bottlenecking everything let's just take it out and it's only it's only it's only translate the next word based off of a few words in the original sentence okay and what we're going to do is we're going to take the weights and we're going to try and essentially assign each word a weight and then make each weight stronger or weaker depending on um depending on which word i need to attend to at the time I'm making the translation, okay? That's what all of these attention boxes you're seeing here are doing, essentially, okay? It, it's kind of different with the intent with the encoder and decoder portions, but that's kind of the uh, intuition there, okay? Which words do I need to wait more in order to make the next part of the translation, okay? Um, I think I'll talk about it here. Um, yeah. Um, so with, uh, before I get to the next slide, just real quick, so with, um, with LLMs, right, and this transformer architecture, right? I want us to kind of think about the transformer architecture is awesome because it was invented in 2017 when this paper came out. Um, and this architecture, y'all, for the most part, I mean, it, 
And it really hasn't changed much. People have made different uh, tweaks. Like maybe they've changed the way the normalizations are doing, the different types of attention, things like that. But for the most part, like AD to 90% of the architecture is used. And, it, and it's still in use today, which is great. But more importantly, the big thing, uh, the way I think about these transformer architectures is almost like it's a, almost a convergent point for a lot of fields and in, in, uh, in, in that require some sort of deep learning, right? Um, because you think about transformers, like you might think, oh, we're just using it for NLP purposes, right? But in reality, like it's not just NLP purposes, right? I mean, people are using this in computer vision. Uh, people are using this for speech to, for, uh, for like um, audio um, data. People are using this for video data, right? People are, people are using this for other kinds of uh, uh, types of data, right? So it's multimodal, right? And they're using this kind of framework or this architecture that I have here um, in those different tasks. So it kind of took all these different fields who are maybe using different types of convolutional neural nets or recurrent neural nets. And it's almost kind of bringing them together and using the same kind of architecture to solve that same, to solve different problems. So it's very unique, it's very versatile, and it's very modular, um, which is why people really liked it. Um, and it's why it's still in use today <laughs> because of that reason. So it's actually really, really cool because of that. Okay. Um, and again, you know, with, with because of that, right, these, these like I said, with, with these NLP models, right, they need to be trained on tons and tons of data, right? There's a tons of information that needs to happen. Um, there's a no. They need to. There's papers. If you read the, if you read the research, there's papers that are trained on millions, billions, or even trillions of tokens. Um, I know this latest version of Llama and Falcon in particular have been trained on trillions of tokens, uh, whether that be words, characters, uh, subsets of characters, things like that. Um, and they're trained from various sources, uh, things like books, social media, uh, communication companies like Slack, Discord, Reddit, things like that. Um, and moreover, in these neural network architectures, there are billions of parameters. Remember, the parameters in a neural net are pretty much the, the neurons in the brain, right? It's how you can understand uh, you know, information. These, mo these models can understand information. So you have all these tokens that are being fed into our neural net, but then you also have a billion parameters that need to be updated, right? That's huge. Like, that is humongous, right? Um, so uh, you know, we need to update the brain with the skill with these parameters was really important. So because of that, right, training these models is very, very, very computationally expensive, right? From scratch, at least. From scratch, it's very computationally expensive and not many companies have the resources to do that, if, if any, um, outside of like the big ones, you know, the big tech companies, okay? Um, these LLMs are very expensive to train. Not, you know, you can't just go to like for now like in my company i can't say let's turn an LLM from scratch <laughs> be like well why you know and, and how much is it going to cost it's, it's not cheap right and you need tons of data to do that you, you need to, you need the infrastructure the architecture to do that right you can't just train this locally on your machine at least big ones like you like you see with llama and stuff um but that's another big thing to keep in mind okay and because of that they can be very difficult to productionize right that's without the correct infrastructure this is something that i'm currently dealing with in my company it's trying to get these things productionized and do it in an efficient way because they're just so big and beefy. Uh, these model jobs, and even if you're fine tuning, it can take hours to days and weeks, depending on which model you want to fine tune. It, it can get pretty intense. So um, something to keep in mind there, okay, with how these things are built. Um, I also have this language model tree, which I think is actually pretty cool. Um, I, I like this tree a lot um, because it kind of paints a picture of everything we've seen in NLP with the language models up until this point, which is pretty awesome. You know, if you see like 2017 really was kind of the, almost the, the starting point of, of how we see NLP today, right? With the language models, where we kind of started off with love and fast text and word to back, but then we slowly built our way up. You know, we have this Elmo and ULM Fit and Ernie and Bart and Bert, Right, we kind of have the encoders right here. Then we have, then we also have the decoders. We have both of them, and you see a lot of them were open source to begin with. But now, as you get uh, farther along the years, um, a lot more of them are becoming closed source, and a lot more of them are becoming on the on the decoder portion. The decoder being pretty much kind of like um, they're generating text, right? Um, and you you see how. A lot more models are being built, but the more and more we get out, everyone wants to kind of make sure their models are not being, you know, they want to make them exclusive, right? So it's not as open knowledge as it once was um, way back when. So 
I think this is really cool to kind of take a look at because it does it does show that evolution that we're going. You see GPT four and Llama and all that stuff coming up, um, and you know Google for the most part and OpenAI have really dominated the space um, as well as Facebook. Um, but you know more com more and more companies are trying to get into this field to try and uh, to build more LLMs. <laughs> So there's some kind of concerns in the NLP space, but also just with LLMs in general, right? So the big thing with, with, the, with LLMs is you want to make sure you understand what data they're trained on. Um, oftentimes, people will build them, but they won't take into account what they're actually doing as far as what data they're to use, right? So for example, you know, healthcare data, like what I work in, is very, it has a very unique kind of syntax, right? Same thing with like banking, same thing with like finance, same thing with like other domains, you know, government, very, whatever you're looking at, right? Some of these LLMs, um, we, have to, we have to read the documentation, but they may not be trained to necessarily uh, not take into account malicious content, right? That's, a, that's, a, that's an important thing, right? You wanna make sure that these models are not necessarily being trained to do um, inherently malicious things, okay? Um, so that's, that's a big thing. And it's oftentimes why companies, um, for example, like, like Bloomberg is a very big, I like to think about Bloomberg because they're, they're a good example of this because it just came out recently. But they kind of realized like, hey, y'all, like none of these models off the shelf really do what we want to do um, for, for their app. So they just built their own GPT model and they, not surprised when they called it Bloomberg GPT. <laughs> um, but they built their own infrastructure to hire an entire team of um, MLEs to pretty much go in and build their own Bloomberg model to try or their GPT model to do what they need to do inside the app, which is pretty, which is pretty cool. Um, so definitely something to keep in, keep in mind, right? Like what data are they actually trained on? Um, another big thing you see in industry a lot is that LLMs and AIs are not silver bullets, right? They're not going to solve all your problems. <laughs> um, they can hallucinate, they can be gullible. You can train them to kind of, or not even train them, just kind of lead them on with responses. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's, they're not going to be an NLB on. You have to have a way to measure risk. That's always a big thing with that. Um, Another big thing is they're gonna be that LLMs are intelligent, but they're not sentient. <laughs> okay. You know, I have to, oftentimes, you know, people come to me like, oh, hey, you know, is, is Skynet coming back? Or is, you know, from Terminator, like, no, man. Like, <laughs> you know, these, these models at the core are just understanding probabilistic patterns, but they're doing it really, really freaking good. You know, they're doing it really, really awesome. They're, they're very convincing, but no, they're not thinking, okay? They're, they're doing what we're asking them to do, okay? But it's based off of this transformer architecture and all the parameters that they have. That's why it's because they're able to do that um, in a very, very awesome way, which is cool. Um, but also to the untrained eye can be pretty scary. So something to keep in mind there. So just a quick summary here to y'all again, LOMs and just NLP in general, right? They're an interesting architecture. They do a bunch of different things. There's, it's a commonality of a bunch of, bunch of different disciplines, which is fantastic. Um, there's a ton of different language models for the ton of different use cases. Um, and they dominate the space right now, guys. I mean, this is the big thing. They, they're dominating the space right now by a long shot. <laughs> uh, a bunch of people want to use AI and uh, these language models to do various things. They think they solve everything. Um, you know, I get, I get requests all the time at my, my work for these kinds of things. It's, you know, they're, they're great and they're awesome, but they do come with risks. They do come with things that they need to be assessed before you try um, and use them <laughs> in your day-to-day -day work. So something to keep in mind there. Okay. Um, and then my last slide here before we go, whoops. Uh, I want to talk to you about kind of NLP um, at IK. Um, so at Interview Kickstart, everything I just talked to you about today, y'all, we pretty much do in, ex, you know, just like, very, very, um, in, a, in a very detailed way. So we actually currently have three modules for this, right? Like I said, there's so much content here, <laughs> right? So we have three different, we have three different content, uh, three different uh, modules here. In the first module, we pretty much talk about the basics of what we, um, in the first few slides, right? So we talk about cleaning, processing, normalizing, uh, talk about bag, uh, bag of words. Uh, we use like um, NLTK and Spacey to try and, um, you know, tokenize text, do basic kind of um, an uh, EDA with that. Uh, try and understand word embeddings with um, like Jensen and build out words effect models and glove and things like that. Um, do things like sentiment analysis and image captioning, right? So we kind of we kind of build that foundation in that first module, which is fantastic. But then once we have that foundation set, we have two other modules. In the second module, we pretty much develop um, all the sequence to sequence modeling, right? 
So think like we kind of talk about LSTMs here, right? And how we actually use that um, in language modeling. Um, as well as we start introducing the transformer architecture, but in particular attention. Attention is a, is a very big thing that gets talked about in, in this in the second module here, because again, that really is kind of the building block or backbone of your transformer architecture, okay? And again, we do this, um, we kind of, we do, it's not just lectures, we give coding examples, we build things from scratch, um, we kind of fine tune things in, in code using PyTorch and TensorFlow, primarily PyTorch, but we do all that from the ground up, right? So we kind of, we kind of, we, you know, we talk about all of this, but then we spend an hour and a half just coding up an example for how to actually build out these neural network models, these transformer models from scratch to show y'all how they're actually being used in industry as well, uh, which is fantastic. Um, and then we, um, after that second module, we kind of do the exact same thing with building, uh, building all the models from scratch and things like that. But we talk in NLP three, this is kind of like modern day you know, NLP. So we talk about things like, what are some, what, what are the some more, more advanced encoder models, decoder models? Let's take transformers again. And then we code something up from scratch to kind of build out our own, you know, miniature burst, uh, fine tune, uh, Roberta you know, to do, a, to do a specific task. How can you actually do that in PyTorch, right? We kind of show you how to do that from scratch. Um, and we give you all the theory behind it as well, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, so all of this here is pretty awesome, y'all. Kind of a, a little spiel here, but um, we do this from the ground up. We do it in a, a lot of detail to kind of show y'all what that looks like. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty fun, it's a pretty fun module. I think it's really, really cool. Um, I'm really looking forward to teaching hopefully soon because <laughs> I think it's really interesting. But um, yeah, this third module is awesome because we pretty much go into all the different modern uh, language models and dive more into them, dive more into their architectures, uh, both in theory, but also in code as well, which is pretty great. Okay. But anyways, y'all, that's, uh, that's kind of the, the idea there for, for uh, NLP. Um, I want to thank y'all so much for your time for this last hour. I think we finished right on time, which is awesome. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, that's pretty much all I have for y'all um, today. Really appreciate y'all's time. Thank you so much. And that was an introduction to NLP, and especially here at IK. <laughs> and let me go ahead. I'll share on my end. Uh, okay, and I can, I can stick around and answer some questions if y'all have some. Oh, I think I got it. Awesome, appreciate it. Yeah, of course y'all, definitely. Always happy to chat. <laughs> Awesome. All righty, all sounds great. Well, if there aren't any um, any other questions, I uh, really appreciate y'all's time, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, it was fun, and um, you yeah, know, hopefully, I will see y'all here at uh, IK. So, should be it should be tons of fun. Oh, and team, just answer your question. Um, there's not a companion repo, um, at least for uh, anything that we've done here. Yeah, um, but um, uh, for some of the stuff we do at IK, there's there's definitely going to be some code that we can kind of show you in, in that regard. Nothing, nothing here just yet. So, all righty, y'all. All right, guys. Well, thank you all so much for your time, y'all. Really appreciate it. Y'all have a wonderful, wonderful day. Talk to you later.